is the chat enabled is the no ma'am it is no ma'am it is not you can keep it enabled we okay. have very serious students here okay so they will write only when it is required however please okay. do not raise the hand in between okay. you can write something on the chat box it's not a problem yeah now it is enabled okay please uh, please start now welcome all to the national academy of sciences india nasi delhi chapter a 10 week course started on 27 july 2020 and i am very happy to introduce today's speaker who is also the convener of this webinar dr punita verma from kalendi college university of delhi uh, can you share the next slide Dr Punita Verma is presently working as an associate professor in physics at Kalendi College DU. She has about 23 years of teaching experience and about 25 years of research experience. Her field of special specialization in research is accelerator based experimental atomic physics. She was awarded the DAG German Academic Exchange Service Program Sandwich Model fellowship for doing the PhD at GS GSI She has been involved in the guidance of 3 PhD and 3 postgraduate 6 undergraduate research project project along with 13 students of MSc who have completed their dissertations on different topics under her She had been awarded the Teaching Excellence Award and the Industry Recommendation Award for the Innovation Research Project She is the member of National Academy of Sciences and several other national science agencies like IAPT, ISRP, VIBA, etc. She has also been awarded National Award of Best Physics Teachers by IAPT. So I am very happy to introduce Dr. Punita Verma, today's speaker, and she will be discussing about statistical mechanics. As you all know, <laughs> you must be referring to all her previous lectures. So. Uh, we welcome you, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much for kind words. Um, as one of the students has raised hand, Karthik. So, Karthik, if you have any issue, then you kindly write it in the chat box. I'm looking at it. Karthi B also has a raised hand. Kindly, quickly write into the chat box so that we can meanwhile start with our proceedings. So. Uh, the chat is enabled if if you have raised hand without knowing then kindly lower it right i will start sharing now uh just one second just i need one second uh kartik and karthi bhi you raised hand please tell us what is it what is it that you want to say i think they have raised it inadvertently or i don't know no answer anyhow so um, i will also i will start from where i stopped yesterday and uh, apart from that i'm going to link my uh, what i am speaking with what has been already heard by you all uh, with whatever has been heard by you all through the lectures of dr aditya and dr uh, 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 through that lectures of dr aditya and dr sanjay one second i'm just sharing my slide just give me a moment there is some Just I need one moment, please. Can you see my slide? No, ma'am. Yeah. 
here it is yeah is it is it uh, is it visible now yes ma'am it's visible so first of all good evening once again for today's session of uh, this webinar series and uh, uh, the, this particular two three days have been planned because the students had repeatedly uh, requested for details of statistical mechanics and not just touching of a formula so this these additional classes of one or one and a half hour or two hour each yesterday today and tomorrow and day before yesterday are planned to give them a complete detail and help them understand the two different perspectives of understanding statistical mechanics number one number two relate the three different uh, lectures that have been del uh, three different uh, uh, perspectives or two different perspectives given to them by the three different lecturers and to uh, initiate them into the process of understanding and learning this subject to totality and this can be achievable if and only if they understand where these this particular subject needs attention and where this particular subject leads to confusion in the minds of the student in my last two three lectures i have repeatedly pointed out the points of confusion in the minds of the student some of you might find uh, the yesterday's lectures and today's lecture a little bit uh, lower in level and that has been as i repeatedly say it has been given it has been uh, prepared on demand because the student said we want little bit more details of statistical mechanics and not just the formula so i have i have repeated this concept now um, uh, i now i want to point out that uh, as it is already clear to the persistent learners of this webinar that statistical mechanics has classical and quantum quantum has two parts both einstein and fermi dirac and radiation which has to be studied from both the aspects and this was the slide which i shared yesterday yesterday in this slide i pointed out that i am not doing the properties of thermal radiation and radiation pressure with you and black body radiation through the thermal radiation part i'm not doing that i'm not touching the details of the kirchhoff's law with you and the stefan boltzmann law with its thermodynamic perspective i want to reiterate that you might at any level of uh, any type of examination or understanding require to understand the theory of radiation in two ways first of all is the thermal radiation right the thermal radiation has a certain uh, so have certain properties and today i am forwarding to you on your whatsapp groups uh, a, uh, a particular uh, written material or resource material which will give you a complete detail of this the pressure exerted by radiation and details of uh, derivation for kirchhoff's law and stefan boltzmann law as far as thermodynamics is concerned that means while calculating kirchhoff's law and stefan boltzmann's law and wien's uh, distribution law and displacement law that will be done only through the thermodynamic concept right up to stefan boltzmann law and then i started speaking yesterday about black body radiation and its spectral distribution i discussed with you how this black body radiation was the beginning point of the beginning of modern physics and its spectral distribution with respect to either frequency or wavelength was the beginning of quantum mechanics and quantum statistics also because planck was the first person to introduce this uh, concept of quantization through its quanta of uh, quanta of radiation which he called packets and the energy was given to each other by the molecular dimensional oscillators assumed to be in a black body to be quantized in nature fine so rayleigh jeans law wien's law whether it is distribution or displacement as is written in the slide wien's displacement law wien's distribution law rayleigh jeans law these are all classical laws right laws which have been followed which have been derived by con uh, considering classical concepts only and yesterday i discussed in detail the rayleigh jeans law right and also um, the the planck's law i reached up till planck's law i explained what is ultraviolet catastrophe i also explained what are planck's quantum postulates and i discussed that planck's law of black body radiation uh, was considered with the postulates of planck and this was also derived in detail and then i pointed out that the wien's distribution law which can be understood through classical concepts can be re understood through planck's concept of black body radiation 
the Planck concept of black body radiation, assuming that the black body consists of oscillators of having the dimension of a molecule and oscillating in a simple harmonic way, exchanges energies with the other oscillators and exchanges energies with the walls of the container, the black body container. And then in a limiting case, then in the limiting case for low frequency and for high frequency, we get back Green's distribution law as well as Rayleigh Jean's law, right? That is why these four words appear again and again. Now, throughout my uh, last two lectures on these uh, today's and last day's lecture is the concept where we are not using partition function. We are, we are not using partition function. And the two perspectives of, of statistical mechanics are that you either uh, consider them first in a, a simple way and then you talk about distribution, but you do not really use the word partition function. You really do not use the word partition function. However, it does not mean that you end up having a different law. The law remains the same. The distribution remains the same. The explanation remains the same. And therefore, it is necessary to understand and not to get confused at the student level for merging and understanding these varied books which have been already shared with you. The drives have been shared with you where you can get the books and all further material will also be shared to you today itself. So now I will go to my, uh, so I will continue from where I stopped and I will give you this perspective of a connection between the, uh, the, the partition function perspective and the one which we are doing right now, the one which I'm doing right now, makes you understand how to understand the concepts of um, uh, these uh, subjects in detail. At the same time, understand that this particular concepts are used by some books which I've already mentioned in my ladder several times. My um, slide has got stuck. So I will just stop share and start share again, right? So, yeah. No. Yeah. So, I've, uh, this is our general, the beginning slide, and now I'm back at where. So, I'm going to end this uh, radiation thing today and give you some numericals which you can uh, which you can practice on your own. These numericals in the uh, PDF form will also forward it to you on your WhatsApp groups where you can do them in detail. We'll do we'll do a small discussion over it, and I will also share how the other two lecturers said the same thing or explained the same thing through different perspectives. And then that perspective will be carried on tomorrow and ended up with some, uh, some, uh, a bunch of numericals on the entire course of statistical mechanics. So uh, now we have a number of photons. So we are now talking about, we are now talking about the uh, distribution function of photons, the distribution function for the photons. That means now we are talking about the Planck's idea and further, further from the Planck's idea, we are now going to use both science and distribution function over a black body where the black body is consisting of photons. Yeah, so now this distribution, <coughs> excuse me, This distribution function, the photon distribution function, as you can see in the first equation here, is the well-known bosons and distribution function for photons. And you're already aware of this. This was discussed in detail by the other two lecturers also. And this particular distribution function, in here we have to remember that in the special case of photons in a black body, I have been, kept, I have been mentioning this several times that Photons and phonons are the only two exceptions which will not, fo not follow the basic general rule applicable on all other systems of statistical mechanics. And that is the number of photons in a black body radiation is not constant. The number of photons in a black body radiation is not constant. So because of non-conservation of photons, why is it not constant? But an obvious question that comes to the mind of the uh, reader is that, is the energy constant or not? Well, the energy is constant. The total energy that the cavity has will remain constant, but the number of photons in the cavity are not constant. And because of this non-conservation of photons, we will, uh, we will put alpha is equal to zero in the expression which I mentioned yesterday. And then we have simply this Bose-Einstein distribution function. If you want to get a rigorous derivation of equation number uh, 39, as mentioned here, that you can find in any of the books which I have mentioned in the lower part of the lab. 
right? Which are not using partition function. So if this is a uh, if this is the function, then we know the photon distribution function wants we what do we want? We want the distribution of energy that is u with respect to wavelength in order to explain the black body radiation. And this u nu du nu has to be equal to h nu, the energy of one photon, and g nu, f nu, d nu. These factors have already been explained yesterday. So substituting these values, which are uh, which have been already uh, calculated yesterday and also in the previous slides, you will have the PPT so you can see for yourself or you can consult the book. It is one and the same thing. You get this expression. So 8 pi h by c cube, mu cube, uh, nu cube d, d nu divided by e to the power h nu by kt or you can say e to the power e by kt minus 1. This is a photon distribution function. However, what is the difference? The difference here is that this photon distribution function has been calculated using the Bose-Einstein distribution function uh, for the photons. And for photons, alpha is equal to zero. The number of photons does not remain constant. However, the energy remains constant. How does it happen? The, uh, uh, the photons within the cavity exchange energy with the walls of the black body as well as with each other in packets of NH nu. So, if the photon is absorbed by the walls of the black body, then also the, the absorption or the emission of photons. And that's how the number of photons varies. Either the photons are absorbed or emitted. And what are photons? There's nothing else but packets of energy. So this absorption and emission of photons so that the number of photons does not remain constant. How is it attained? It is attained with the overriding condition, with the overriding condition that the total amount of energy must remain constant. With this overriding condition, the bose einstein distribution function already introduced to you, already known to you, F nu is then directly used to calculate this U nu D nu, which is nothing else, which is nothing else but the distribution of energy with respect to the frequency uh, in a black body radiation spectrum. And once again, and once again, one can easily see that 8 pi h by c cube being uh, constants, the uh, spectral distribution is completely explained by nu, nu cube d nu divided by e to the power h nu by kt, where h nu is nothing else but the energy of the photon. Right? So now, with this, the, this is the well known uh, photon distribution function or the Bose Einstein distribution, which gave a correct and a proper explanation of the uh, black body radiation, a complete and a proper explanation of the black body radiation. And initiated by Planck's idea, and therefore Planck's, Bose, and Einstein are responsible for understanding of this black body radiation. To find the maximal, uh, maximum wavelength of this black body spectrum, this equation for you can be expressed in terms of lambda, and that you can do because you know frequency is related to lambda. And then you can calculate du by d lambda yourself and equate it to zero. If you do that, if you do that, then you get the expression of lambda maximum and just adjustment of the equation a bit from right hand side to left hand side directly leads to the situation hc by kt lambda maximum is equal to 4.965 a constant okay and this particular this particular equation is then rearranged to what is uh, to, to the form which is shown in equation number 40 and that is means displacement law right so that is lambda max into t is equal to hc by 4.965 into k. H, C, and k are all constants, and therefore you can just substitute them and you get this value. So, who is getting displaced? Why is it called means displacement law? It is called means displacement law because it is showing how the maximum of the wavelength in a black body spectrum is getting displaced towards lower frequencies as the temperature is increased. I repeat, this means that. This particular equation, Bain's displacement law, is exhibiting how the wavelength of the wave, maximum wavelength attained at a particular temperature moves towards lower frequencies when the temperature is increased. Now, with this, what have we done? We have first tried to understand Planck's distribution function uh, from the idea which did not employ the concept of photons, which did not use the concept of Bose Einstein distribution. So yesterday when I arrived at the Planck's distribution function, I only considered oscillators of molecular dimensions, oscillating in a black body, exchanging energy in packets. 
and using the most probable distribution as the maxwell boltzmann distribution that was the starting point that was the starting point to assume that the most probable distribution is like maxwell boltzmann and what is maxwell boltzmann distribution it is a classical distribution so what we did yesterday was the classical concept of perspective of calculation of planck and today we have used both signs and distribution function which is uh, this equation number uh, 39 and with this distribution function we have used our logic of why photons are not conserved and so on and hence we have calculated the planck's formula the formula obviously remains the same in both the cases right now from here the planck's law we have come back to wien's displacement law and we can also similarly do it for wien's distribution law also and these laws are classical in nature that means they were initially expressed or explained with the use, with the use of classical statistical mechanics and henceforth and henceforth this distribution wien's displacement law wien's distribution law stefan's boltzmann law or any other law like religion's law when uh, when we apply uh, in the limiting case to the planck's uh, uh, planck's equation given below equation number 9.39 when you apply the limit of low frequency uh, then you get Rayleigh's law. If you apply the limit of new tending to higher frequencies, ultraviolet side, then you start getting Green's law. So I'm sure many of you are already aware of it. Nevertheless, it is uh, it is not a problem, and it is extremely good in order to you know recapitulate everything so that for once and for all your subject is there embedded into your brain. Right. So now the last section. Sorry. So the last section here is now the Stefan's Boltzmann law. And this Stefan's Boltzmann law, already, already known to us through thermodynamics, already known to us through thermodynamics, and therefore was a, a very much present there in your thermodynamics uh, course. However, we are obtaining this law from Planck's law. So now total energy density, U of the radiation, how do you get it? It's a very obvious, you integrate it from zero to infinity, you apply this these limits, and then you calculate this integral which comes out to be just a two step simple mathematics and you obtain this particular equation written on top of the slide so 8 pi to the power 5 k4 uh, 15 c divided by 15 c cube h cube t to the power 4 and as you can see that the stefan's boltzmann law all other factors are constants except temperature t so we can easily write it as 80 to the power 4 and this is the this is the law which tells us that everybody will radiate according to its temperature uh, the energy density of radiation for any <coughs> for any particular radiating body will depend only upon its temperature so a is a universal constant you can calculate its value and keep it for your numerical usage the total energy density is proportional to the fourth power of the absolute temperature whose temperature of the cavity walls we therefore expect that the energy r radiated by an object per second per unit area per second for time if you want to take it through time per unit area for any particular surface that you're interested in is always proportional to t to the power 4 and this is known as the stefan's boltzmann law the stefan's boltzmann law can be expressed as r is equal to e sigma t to the power 4 and obviously you can then calculate the value of stefan's constant the stefan's constant sigma is sigma is equal to ac by 4 and you can numerically calculate these values and for all numericals which are based upon these laws means uh, the displacement law stefan's boltzmann's law or uh, rayleigh jeans law or uh, 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 even kirchhoff's law these factors or these num numbers should be there into your memory so that you can use them directly and not waste time in uh, uh, any other thing except the establishment of which particular formula to be used for which particular concept and numerical so with that we end with uh, radiation and uh, when we end with radiation this does not mean that within three hours we have completed it to the entire extent i now uh, suggest that you should go through the first three ladder books by tomorrow so that the radiation part is completely clear to you radiation is available in any every book uh, however, the notations will differ. The way of explanation obviously differs. However, the concept or the um, uh, numericals which emerge out of all these can be easily listed down in just a single sheet of paper.
so your radiation is nothing else but a single sheet of paper pointing out the main concepts assumptions hypothesis and constant values because of several constants that appear and dependencies new cube or new square e to the power 4 or what and this is uh, the real way to uh, grasp any concept in this particular subject at least and actually in all the subjects so now let me move a little bit further and uh, what am i trying to do so the perspective with which we are move using we are not using the partition function and soon i will share the slides with you where the partition function approach towards the same things although not radiation although not radiation was used to explain all this to you in a short form right so uh, now uh, we are still trying to understand that where all classical physics failed where all classical physics failed and what all we had to do in order to understand that yes the classical physics is unable to understand or unable to explain some natural phenomena which we are observing in either solids for uh, for example calculation of specific heats of solids or conductivity and hence how the electrons are conducting electricity that is fermi dirac statistics will be used and specific heats of solids also showed that the classical physics fails again now as i mentioned in my very first lecture in the first week of this webinar series is that at this level of either ending graduation or post graduation you should dissolve the boundaries between the subjects and view the system as a whole on which you are simultaneously simultaneously applying quantum atomic molecular solid state statistical mechanics in totality i repeat at this point when we talk about solids then you should not think that this is a portion of the solid state physics when you're talking about a solid and for example if you talk about the specific heat of solids and see how statistical mechanics showed that classical concepts just could not be applied just could not be applied then here at this point we must remember that apart from statistical mechanics the quantum is is also at play the solid state uh, concepts are at play and uh, similarly atomic and molecular because the solid will either have will have a lattice of either atoms or molecules depending upon which kind of solid you are talking about right so with these four words uh, what happened so i will quickly go through all these concepts because i'm sure you all being graduates or post graduates you are aware of all these but sometimes not being able to grasp a concept or numerical emanates from uh, overconfidence that oh yes this is so simple we know it it is very nice and good to recapitulate your your uh, ideas so uh, in black body radiation we use quantum statistical mechanics how did we use quantum statistical mechanics we use the concept of bose einstein distribution function okay and then we also said that there is internal energy of the system and we also know that the internal energy of the solid varies with the temperature now uh, let us talk about specific heats now you know what is a specific heat we can consider molar specific heat of a solid at constant volume or at constant pressure let us talk about first cv that is molar specific heat at constant volume now as we know what is molar specific heat that is uh, by the the simplest definition it is the amount of energy or the in or heat that must be added to say 1 kilo mole of the solid and whose or volume is held fixed this we know since uh, since lower classes itself and what do we want to do we want to raise its temperature by say 1 degree kelvin 1 kelvin sorry not 1 degree kelvin so uh, and we also know that uh, specific heat at constant pressure cp is 3 or 2 5 percent higher than cv in solids because it includes the work associated with a volume change as well as the change in the internal energy so all the time in statistical mechanics if your concepts of thermodynamics are not in proper place if you have confusions regarding the laws of thermodynamics the maxwell's relations that are present there their interrelations and their corollary then at every point you reach a block therefore it is suggested and advisable that for all those who find uh, application of sudden uh, thermodynamics to different concepts uh, surprise then you should go back and secure that subject in your memory and understanding first <coughs> so now uh, we know that if you are talking about a solid then whatever the constituent particles are 
in a solid. They, what all can they be? They can be atoms, they can be ions, or they can be molecules. Then uh, they, that, uh, the internal energy of the solid is nothing else but the energy, total energy of all these particles, whether they're atoms or ions or molecules. Now let us stick to one and understand because if one is understood, all others are understood also. Now let us say that if there are atoms, if there are atoms, then what are the different kind of vibrations that can take place? Very simple, any single atom can vibrate, can translate, can vibrate in three different directions. So if it is so, if it is so, here again, here again we can use the concept of harmonic oscillators as we have employed earlier. Okay, and so that's what the classical physicists did. And they said, let us consider according to classical physics, a harmonic oscillator, which is in a system in thermal equilibrium at a temperature T. And automatically, automatically, they applied the equipartition law of energy. And they said, okay, these particular um, uh, harmonic oscillators, which are nothing else but the atoms. I've taken example of atoms. You can take molecules and ions also. Not a problem. So they are they are oscillating, and then uh, they will have an average energy of kT. So if that is the case, then each atom in a solid will have three kT of energy. So now, if you have one kilomole of a solid having um, Avogadro number of atoms, then its total energy can be called as E, and the temperature T. What would you say? You would say that the classical ener internal energy of a solid should be then equal to the and zero kt which is the first equation visible to you i repeat what have we done in order to explain the specific heat of solids the classical statistics was used in the concept that let us assume that every solid has got some constant particles these constant particles are say atoms or ions or molecules for convenience take atoms if they are atoms they're oscillating very good how harmonically simple harmonic motion how in the three directions and then we can say that according to classical statistical mechanics the internal energy of the solid must be equal to 3 and 0 kt where k is the boltzmann constant and hence you can directly write 3 rt and you know what is r very well that is 8.31 to the power 3 joules per kilo mole uh, dot k right okay so this is the universal gas constant now we recall that in an ideal gas sample of n kilo moles we know PV is equal to nRT, so easily we can write this specific heat at constant volume to be equal to CV is equal to del E del T by V. This equation is known to us even through thermodynamics. So automatically, the DeLong and Petit law, which is also known to us, right, is that the specific heat capacity must be equal to 3R, which is uh, which you can calculate to be equal to almost 6 kilocalories per kilomole per K. Now, this, this is just a, a very short abbreviation explanation of how the specific heats of solids was explained using the classical concept. So, Dulong and Petit law is a classical concept using the concept of oscillators, harmonically oscillating within a solid. Total energy is dependent only upon that, and hence this these equations, and hence these equations. So, fine. If that is the case, then it should explain everything. But what happened? Once again, as we know already, that the Dulong and Petit law failed miserably for light atoms such as boron or carbon or beryllium or sodium, etc. So, uh, what happened? The specific heats of all the solids dropped sharply at low temperatures and approached zero. I think I have a graph later to, to show that. Okay, so something was wrong. That means the explanation taken up by the classical statistics to use the concept of harmonic oscillator and the average energy of kt total energy of 3 kt uh, 3 rt was not able to explain the concept completely and hence hence in the final year of graduation you are introduced towards the einstein's formula of application of einstein's einstein's formula obviously included the concept of quantization and tried to explain the uh, behavior of solids and the behavior of specific heat as observed through various elements in the periodic table. <clears throat> so uh, Einstein pointed out that uh, there is this problem. It cannot be taken like this. And the problem is that this AT cannot be, for, uh, cannot be used for the average energy per oscillator 
in a solid that's what that was what that was the main idea of plan so what is the flaw like the flaw is responsible for this in the same flaw the same flaw as i repeat was also responsible for the wrong derivation or the wrong interpretation or the wrong inference that emanated because of the rayleigh jeans formula applied on black body radiation so einstein said that the probability uh, f mu that any oscillator will have a frequency mu is has to has to be given by the equation has to be given by the equation i i think i showed that uh, equation yesterday one minute uh, so yeah one minute yeah so one can see it back here so the famous boltzmann distribution law again this equation number 39 so einstein said that no whatever you are assuming is not correct the distribution function has to obey the equation number 39 and what is this distribution function this is the bose einstein distribution function here shown for photons but also applicable in the case of solids now how do we reach how do you reach from photons to solids where there is no concept of photons involved so he said no we have to take the average energy of the oscillator in this manner as shown in equation number 52 the average energy of the oscillator is equal to energy of 1 h nu multiplied by f nu and that is equal to h nu by e to the power h nu by q and and we can see immediately that the average energy is not kt the average energy is not kt so the internal energy of the solid internal energy of the solid which should be equal to uh, e which which is equal to e it is equal to 3 and 0 e bar and then you multiply 52 equation with 3 and 0 and you get this e expression for the total energy which is the internal energy of the solid if that is the case then einstein specific heat formula will give cv is equal to del e delta you differentiate it with respect to uh, temperature keep the volume constant calculate and this is what you get which is equation number 54 here so is it perfect that's the question is it perfect is it able to explain everything or is there something that we have to think upon in this particular equation let's look at the equation again 3 r h k are all constants and they are coming twice in the formula we have new square dependence and then we have exponential both in the numerator and the are we on the right track let us look so we can see that this approach is on the right track because at high temperature what will happen h nu will become very much less than kt and then e to the power h nu by kt because of its exponential nature will be equal to 1 plus h nu by kt because you know very well how to expand an exponential e to the power x so what do we get this is the figure i was talking about so lead aluminum silicon carbon so x axis is having absolute temperature k and uh, along uh, that on the x axis the y axis has the specific heat cv plotted in kilocal per kilomole multiplied by the kelvin so the variation with temperature of this molar specific heat at constant value volume for several elements what do we observe for lead aluminum silicon carbon we have this nature so uh, the equation that we have h nu by h, h nu and h nu by kt it cancels out and then we get the answer in the previous equation for average energy to be equal to kt and cv is equal to 3r so the dulong poitier law can be understood as a corollary or as an automatic explanation from einstein's explanation for high temperatures now as the temperature decreases the val value given by this particular equation one second so as the temperature uh, as the temperature decreases what will happen let us look at equation number 54 the value of cv which is given by this particular equation decreases if the temperature decreases now the reason is that from the classical behavior and now what are we considering now we are considering that the uh, spacing between the possible energies is becoming large relative to kt 
and as a result uh, we do not have energies possessed above the zero point energy what is this zero point energy i'm talking about in my last day's lecture i mentioned that once you are assuming that your oscillators are uh, oscillating in a simple harmonic motion then you have to remember the results of schrodinger wave equation applied to a harmonic oscillator whereby you know that the energy is equal to half h nu plus uh, half h nu at zero point that means the lowest energy level is equal to half h nu so the zero point energy has to be remembered in all cases wherever you are applying harmonic oscillator so uh, a very automatic question is that where is the zero point energy of harmonic oscillator now can somebody answer i am looking at the chat box let me see how much quantum mechanics you remember how many lectures today ma'am don't worry not long so i would like to ask you that what happened to the zero point energy of a harmonic oscillator where is it now are you can you suggest something what where is the zero point energy now i take i give you a minute please think and reply Uh, no it's not in the form of potential energy could you rephrase the question yes i can rephrase the question yesterday i had said that since two days i'm continuously talking about classical statistical mechanics its failure then its subsequent explanation the quantum statistical mechanics so we first said Rayleigh genes failed weans failed and then Planck succeeded why did he succeed because he considered he considered harmonic oscillation of oscillators which were assumed to be in a black body harmonically oscillating and hence if there are oscillators in a black body harmonic oscillating then we should think about harmonic oscillators and if we think about harmonic oscillators of molecular dimensions we must apply quantum mechanics and if we do that then we have to remember what we got as an answer to the derivation of schrodinger wave equation applicable to simple harmonic oscillator if we do that then we remember that the harmonic simple harmonic oscillator when explained through schrodinger wave equation gives us zero point energy of half h nu and that was not applied earlier by rayleigh genes and hence the mistake and hence the mistake yeah so ashwarya vishwakarma gave the correct answer zero point energy adds a constant that will not be dependent on temperature right this is the correct answer zero point energy adds a constant it is half h it is half so half h nu and therefore it does not it does not it is not dependent upon temperature very good so it vanishes and therefore del del t at constant volume is taken to find cv we don't have to consider that now you see it is as you as you can appreciate as you can probably appreciate it is not possible to go detail into doing derivations of all these steps but these listing of these equations itself draws your attention to the fact that which are the concepts that we should focus upon we should focus upon what was the basic assumption number one well, how did you get average energy what did you think about internal energy and if you assume something what was the assumption if there was something to be applied what was that that was applied and then how did we get the final formula rest of the detailed derivations are definitely not uh, of any use as far as grasping of concepts are concerned but because that is just pure mathematics so mathematics is to a physicist just as uh, a dictionary is is to a person who is writing an article so when he, when an art, when a literary person wants to write a nice article 
the literary person goes to a dictionary, finds her beautiful, nice words, and tries to express the article in the best expressions through language. And what does a physicist do? The physicist observe the uh, observe any particular phenomena, try to understand the concept, and in order to explain those concepts, you mathematically uh, employ use of various mathematical entities that are known to us and try to explain it to the best of our capability. And what cannot be managed is shifted into the assumption or hypothesis. Whatever cannot be managed is shifted into the hypothesis or assumption. For example, in kinetic theory of gases, in order to avoid detailed equations of interaction amongst the constituent gas molecules, we say that there is no potential energy of interaction. It does not interact, they do not interact with each other, they do not interact, they, they are far apart, because the moment you say they are close, close to each other, you will have to write down all equations of motion, and hence your results will not be so simple as are known to you now. I hope I'm able to strike a I'm able to strike a resonance to you on how to read a particular subject, grasp the main points, the main assumption, hypothesis, what is the energy? Because here mass does not play a great role in statistical mechanics, except in certain cases. So you do not see M appearing here and there everywhere. The mass is not our focus. What is on focus? The focus is energy or momentum. And within momentum, mass is already taken care of. The phase space, right? Then the total energy and its distribution. We are bothered about the behavior of a macroscopic entity, a macroscopic system, and we want to know how will it behave. So the obvious question is that if we want to understand how will it behave, then with respect to what? With respect to time? Answer, no. For the present case, no. No, respect of, no with respect to time. With respect to frequency in case of radiation, with respect to wavelength in case of radiation, and with respect to temperature in case of specific heats of solids. So it suffices, it is sufficient then, it is sufficient then to have just a few formula to deal with the entire statistical mechanics. And in, case, and in fact, if you do end up understanding the entire statistical mechanics, it shrinks itself into just two pages. In just two pages, you can have a beautiful summary of how either partition function is used or it is not used. You can have a complete conceptual grasping of the subject. Because detailed mathematics is not required for any kind of uh, any kind of examination that you have to go through for understanding and for explaining definitely without derivations how would you get a formula so they are essential however uh, for for uh, detailed examinations like university examinations you must know how you are deriving but just guys while cooking a particular dish or making a particular model there are steps. Therefore, in order to understand statistical mechanics, you should also go by the recipe style. That means what are the main points and ultimately the main points for any particular uh, phenomena, specific heat of solid, Fermi Dirac explanation of the conductivity of metals, black body radiation, helium explanation, negative temperature is nothing else but a bunch of four or five steps. So I hope I'm striking a resonance with you. So. That means we know that this is the case, Einstein's specific heat formula, and obviously you're most welcome to check out the books as well as um, read them in detail. I, I have been already supplying many things to you, many, uh, many much material to you, and I shall be doing that more. So I will now just move a little bit further. Again, it has got stuck. Kindly excuse me, the slide has, I don't know why. So, I think I missed one for me, energy. No, yeah, I will do it. So, I will now very briefly talk about the free electrons in a metal. You see, we applied Einstein's idea. What is Einstein's idea? Einstein's idea is Bose Einstein distribution function. We use the Bose Einstein distribution function to give a correct explanation to give a correct explanation to the specific heat of solids and quickly understood that and quickly understood that the Dulong and Petit law, which is valid for high temperatures in a solid, can easily be 
obtained as an inference or a corollary from the Einstein's distribution function. The Einstein's distribution fun function is manifested through the Bose Einstein distribution function. Now let's quickly let's quickly do free electrons in a metal. So now this is the last step of touching of Fermi Dirac statistics in the simple way. And then I go to, I will show you the slides of partition function explanation of again the whole thing. The, so yesterday somebody asked, how do we relate the day before yesterday's class to this present class? I said it will come in the coming two days. That is, today is Monday. So Monday and Tuesday, you will get the whole perspective. So till tomorrow you will uh, get the complete perspective and, and and i'm sure you'll be more comfortable in understanding the subject there so we proceed towards now one free electrons in a metal we know that free electrons in a metal are uh, the, are the ones which are responsible for conductivity now no more than one electron per quantum state why is this statement made this statement is made because the electrons are fermions the electrons are fermions we know they have a half integral multiple uh, they have a half integral multiple of uh, there's something missing in the slide no so yeah okay so why not more than one electron per quantum state okay so the electrons are fermions by nature all electrons are fermions by nature and these fermions must obey Fermi Dirac statistics. And what does Fermi Dirac statistics say? The Fermi Dirac statistics basic distribution itself tells you that not more than one particle per state is allowed. Not more than one particle per state is allowed. So if you have two states, then in one state you'll have only one particle. And if there is another particle available, it must go to the other quantum state, right? And this is because of Fermi Dirac statistics obeying obeying Pauli exclusion principle. Obeying Pauli exclusion principle. You know Pauli exclusion principle since your uh, lower classes itself. It in, and in the simplest way you learned it through chemistry that if you have a spin down electron, then you have to consider the other one as spin up in the next state. So in a typical metal, each atom contributes one electron to the electron gas. What is this electron gas? We assume that in a solid, you have uh, whatever solid you have chosen in a periodic table, then all the electrons of those solid, the ones which are in the valence electrons, they move as, a, as, if they are, as if a swarm of bees, they move like that. And these electrons are not bound because they're in the valence uh, shell and they are free to move about amongst the neighboring atoms and hence they belong in totality to the lattice and the metal and not only to the atom to which they are actually bound for its configuration. So once again, if there is an atom, we know the shells and we know that there are valence electrons and the valence electrons are free and these valence electrons which are free are considered as a electron gas. It is common, it is common because it is available to all the atoms together in the lattice and it moves around like a gas. It moves around like a gas. So electron gas means a gas of electrons, right? Not of some atomic or molecular gas. So in a typical metal, each atom contributes one electron to the common electron gas. So let us consider one kilomole of the metal. Then there are about N0 free electrons. If these electrons behave like the molecules of an ideal gas, huh? Then what will we say? We will say it would have, each would have about 3 by 2 kT of kinetic energy. This, this fact we know and is clear to us by now. So then what will be the, inert, the energy of the metal? Uh, the energy of the metal, inert, internal energy obviously, which is due to the electrons, will be obviously equal to 3 by 2 N0 kT, which is equal to 3 by 2 R2. Right? It's a very simple thing. So the molar specific heat due to the electrons, so the molar specific heat due to the electrons should be equal to CV. I'm sorry, a little por bit portion of the equation is cut. It should be del E del T at constant volume, obviously, because we are calculating specific heat at constant volume. And the denominator that is cut below 3 is 2. So 3 by 2 R. So CV is equal to 3 by 2 R. 
So what should be the total specific heat of the metal? Obviously, the total specific heat of the metal should be 3R plus 3 by 2R. It should be equal to 9 by 2R. And, and this should be valid at high temperatures where you can actually apply classical analysis or classical interpretation very easily. We know very well that Dulong and Petit, uh, uh, sorry, the Dulong and Petit value of 3R holds at high temperature. This is known to us. I'm going a little bit uh, uh, in a summarized way because too many details are not possible. However, if you have any question, please pose by day after tomorrow. All your questions which have been not answered till now will be answered one by one. So, an obvious question that comes to your mind is that what happened to the free electrons? Do they contribute to the specific heat? Do they not contribute to the specific heat? What exactly is the status? Now for this, now for this, you must think a little bit. Just think a little bit. What have you been doing or what have we been doing? Now, what are the quantities or the entities which are involved in the specific heat of a metal? Now, when we used, in Einstein's model, we used harmonic oscillators. And in the Debye's model, which you are also aware of, we used phonons. Now, both of these are bosons. Both of these are bosons. The harmonic oscillators in the Einstein's model and the phonons in the Debye's model they both are bosons and they obey the Bose-Einstein statistic. However, as I mentioned, however, as I mentioned, that electrons are all fermions and they must obey Fermi-Dirac statistic. And obviously, then the first sentence which I said again and again, that not more than, not more than one uh, particle per state, that means not more than one electron per quantum state. Now, when we considered bosons, we saw that the bosons consideration also led to Maxwell-Boltzmann statistics having energy of half kT per degree of freedom when we increase the temperature. So we have understood very well by now that if we increase the temperature, we can find out the classical physics laws which we know already since our lower classes as a corollary of the either Fermi-Dirac or Bose-Einstein distribution function. Now, what we, when we say high temperature, what is high temperature? Then generally we say our room temperature is high. But we don't actually define what do you mean by high. So the high temperature may not be what you call high for the other statistics. So if you are applying Bose-Einstein distribution function uh, to the former case which I discussed in black body radiation, and here you are applying uh, the other concept. So, do you mean to say, do you mean to say that the temperature at which I should test this particular distribution and that Bose-Einstein distribution function, should we have the same temperature? No, it's not necessary. The temperature for the two cases can be entirely different. One is a black body, the other is a metal. So. <coughs> if we remember our Fermi Dirac distribution function, which I know you are very well aware of, then the average occupancy per state, I am using the, the distribution function directly as the first equation in my slide. Please look at the first slide. Uh, please look at the first equation on the slide. Average occupancy per state. What have we used? We have used the Fermi Dirac distribution function. This distribution function has the same form irrespective of whether you use a partition function or you don't use the partition. I explained myself the concept of EF, that is the Fermi energy, that is exponent 1 by exponential, bracket open, e to the power minus EF by kT. So in my day before yesterday's lecture, I had explained in detail what is Fermi energy EF. It is the energy till which all the levels are completely filled at t is equal to 0 degree kelvins sorry, D T is equal to 0 K. And as you increase the temperature, that rectangular or square type of graph starts turning into a type of decaying fashion like exponential tape, right? So the Fermi energy is the energy till which all the quantum states are filled. And after Fermi energy, these quantum states are empty. But this is a situation only and only when temperature is 0 kelvins. You increase the temperature, that rectangle starts deviating, okay? 
so now let us quickly draw, draw an analog or analogy let us quickly draw an analogy i think it's already one hour i would like to give a, a break of uh, uh, five minutes to the students so that they can recapitulate what i've said hello would you like a break of uh, five minutes students would you like to have a okay so we just stop for five minutes okay ma'am uh, dr parul can you just huh. please stop the recording so they can have a break please okay, think over what we are doing hmm. i'm making for me statistical mechanics is a beautiful poem right and these equations are only supporting the feeling of statistical mechanics going about as a poem it is like a story explaining physics and therefore it is extremely wonderful so i we take a break of 5 minutes and we join again after i mean it's the, please don't leave the link you can we can stop for 5 minutes right yeah so yes. please start the recording again yes, and i i already this. started yeah okay. student ma'am again joined us to continue such a wonderful and informative uh, lecture ma'am we welcome you yeah. again yeah 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 yes i'm myself welcomed uh in my own endeavor to serve these students for understanding of physics right so we were talking about average occupancy per state and i said that we are directly picking up the fermi dirac distribution function the rigorous derivation i have skipped keep the derivation apart we know each derivation will lead to this fermi dirac distribution function now what we can do is we can argue how do we explain how do we explain all this through what or linking it to what we have done till now let us let us just knock our memory and think what did we do day before yesterday in order to understand black body spectrum we started with in classical physics with the assumption let there be a black body which has got perfectly reflecting walls let us consider it has got a cube of three uh, a cube uh, and hence its three directions are having a length l so a cube of side l, side uh, l or a cube of length l of the side right and then we said there are standing waves in the cavity and the, the hence from that standing wave supposition started our uh, endeavor or started our effort to understand black body spectrum through classical statistical mechanics right now similarly we can sim simply if we want to understand this in the same way let us understand it in the same way we can we can say just as we said earlier that the number of standing waves in a cubical cavity l on a side is given by the equation gj dj is equal to pi j square dj same equation was used earlier what is j here j is equal to 2 by lambda i hope you remember that otherwise you can always cross check from the book so j is equal to 2 by lambda is what we used in order to understand black body spectrum through real genes and that same uh, same uh, logic or same argument we are using that let j be is equal to 2l by lambda where l is the length of a cubical cavity one cube we have considered and let us consider that there is a number there are a number of standing waves inside it <clears throat> now if that is the case then what can we say in the case of an electron what is this lambda we are talking about electrons we are talking about the conductivity of electrons in a metal and here the lambda is not the wavelength of the wave as mentioned there in a black body radiation spectrum here the lambda is the de broglie wavelength of the wave, of the electron because we know that the moment we started talking about modern physics the first thing that we had to do immediately after understanding the structure of the atom discovered by rutherford and his co-workers was the de broglie de broglie wavelength so with this i would like to tell you a very short two sentence story three sentence story about it so as far as my knowledge goes uh, de broglie's hypothesis as he was preparing his dissertation on this concept was not accepted was not accepted by his supervisor and so he had grave problems in convincing the scientific community about his dual nature of matter and it was einstein who said that it can be considered it can be considered whether this particular proposition of de broglie is correct or not and rest is history you know that without de broglie's concept of wave matter uh, the uh, matter duality wave matter duality 
he would have been nowhere there would have been no quantum mechanics applications over atomic and subatomic world and so on yes so that was the story so uh, be open in the mind be open in your mind and be modern in your thoughts that is most important to for a human being be always modern be ready to accept something new be ready to at least test it and only after experimentation with it decide whether it is correct or not that ends uh, that ends my story so in the case of an electron lambda here is the de broglie wavelength which we know lambda is equal to h by p very well now electrons in a metal have non relativistic velocities that we are very sure of so obviously what will be p p is equal to root over 2 me and we know these uh, these equations are neither uh, new to us nor are, are a surprise to us that is the case please substitute within j is equal to 2l by lambda the value of lambda which is equal to h by p and then substitute in the third step here the value of uh, momentum and then calculate the derivative of dj very good and these simple uh, baby type mathematics can be then substituted in equation number 33 and what do we get what do we get we get gede what is this gede these these gede this word g we have been used we, we have been using it as a degeneracy we have been using it as a degeneracy what does g signify here let us look at its dependence a true to is a number pi is a number h is a constant l is a cubical length cavity that you have considered and m is the mass of the electron which is also very well known and left is root over e d e so what have we got we have got the number of standing waves in a cavity having a wavelength lambda having a wavelength lambda so as in the case of standing waves in a cavity the exact shape of the metal sample does not matter what did we do in a cavity we said there is a cavity did we speak about what should be the cavity how it should be which which kind of uh, which kind of volume it must have which kind of shape it must have no there in that cavity also while considering standing waves we simply said that in a cavity standing waves exist and let us now move forward considering its wavelength and we deduced many things out of it similarly here the exact shape of this metal sample does not matter and we can substitute its volume v for l q right and then what do we get just a sec just a sec why is it not working ah uh, it's again so much stuff it's not moving yeah now it does so did it move the yeah did it move huh? yes okay so in the early this equation of ged what have we calculated we have calculated the number of electron states which electrons the free electrons what do they do they conduct electricity they are the electron gas and on those electron gas we want to find out how the number of electron states are distributed and in order to find out that distribution and ultimately the number we must find out the number also we must find out the number also we have in our assumption used the fermi dirac distribution function we have used the fermi dirac distribution function as the first assumption as our first equation as our first logic to say that in a gas in order to understand the conductivity of the electrons in a gas metal we must first understand that the distribution function can be only fermi dirac in nature and not bose-einstein sign in nature because it is fermion first of all number 1 and number 2 in order to go about it we say that electrons can be considered uh, uh, we can calculate the standing waves in a cavity for a black body and similarly we can calculate the number of electron states ged by this particular methodology or a particular argument or logic that there are a number of standing waves in a cubical cavity l as we have done earlier but why could we do it how and why can we use this argument we can use this argument because because in an electron has two spin states this we know plus half minus half we know this very well so it has got two spin states up spin and down spin and we know this very well and this is this is kind of um, similar or identical this is kind of similar or identical to the polarization of the standing waves which we used earlier in black body spectrum in black body spectrum we use standing waves 
then we said these standing waves have got two states of polarization and we use the factor of two if you remember in our equations and the same formalism we have applied here so if you understand just black body spectrum if you understand its black body spectrum uh, calculation of those three four equations that we did you automatically can explain both uh, specific heat of metals and fermi dirac distribution function application using the concept of scattering so what do we achieve in that what do we achieve in that we get the number of electron states as have been mentioned here and now the final step to end up all this would be after getting the number of electron states must be to calculate the total energy n and then must also mention about the fermi energy we know a little bit about fermi energy but till now we have not given an expression to it as a formula which comes automatically out of these arguments that i have been trying to convince you about i am trying to convince you why i am applying fermi dirac distribution to electron gas metal in metals why am i not using bose einstein and then i am i am trying to convince you how and why i can use the concept of standing waves in a cavity which have two states of polarization to this particular example or application i can do it because the electrons have two states of uh, two states of spins plus half and minus half so the the scenario is similar and hence i can use that uh, logic and come about with the calculation of number of electron states which as equation number 55 shows clearly depends upon mass yes and it depends upon square root of the energy it depends upon mass yes and square root of the energy rest all the all the things will be constant for a particular case given to you so when you will calculate number of electron states you will not calculate for any volume any particular application will definitely specify how big a volume of metal or solid which is conducting electrons uh, which has got conducting electrons is having so the volume will be specified rest are all numbers and electrons mass is also a constant number so the ged number of electron states how many number how many number of states are there in which the electrons can be distributed it depends entirely upon square root of e now these small things should be focused upon in your mind while you read an equation just as i did in equation number 55 i am looking at the equation and i am settling in my brain not the formula of the equation as it is because it is not easy to memorize so much however it is very easy to remember that the square root of the energy will determine how many electrons will be uh, available in the different states in the system that you are considering which system the one which you have defined whose volume is known to you, known to you so this particular dependence itself will enable you to understand several kind of concepts numericals and so on and so forth in statistical mechanics so in order to understand the fermi energy now what do we have to do what was fermi energy the fermi energy was such was the definition of fermi energy was this that at temp temperature of 0 kelvins you keep on filling the states in fermi dirac statistics you start filling from the lowest possible state available so if your lowest possible state is of say 0.1 electron volt then you will first put your electron there and then you have 0.2 electron volt then you'll put the next electron there so filling of states in case of fermi dirac distribution is always from the lowest available possible state you will keep on filling them remembering pauli exclusion principle you keep on filling them only one electron per state and then you reach the fermi level <coughs> so at t is equal to 0 n number of free electrons are there and then you start filling them from lowest energy say e is equal to 0 to top now when you reach the highest level your fermi energy has reached and that's the very definition of fermi energy so what do you mean this means <coughs> this automatically means that the number of electrons that can have the same amount of energy e is equal to what i'm repeating i want to find out what is the number of electrons that can have the same energy e this has to be equal to the number of states that have this energy so simple i repeat i repeat so you have a system say you have a metal you have got five energy levels 
okay and you have say uh, 10 uh, you, you have five energy levels and you have say four electrons then you will start filling from the lowest level one in one second in the second one third in third one fourth in fourth one and now if i want to find out how many energy levels are filled all i have to do is find out the number of electrons because i know that only one electron will go into one energy state only one electron will go into one quantum state and hence if you've count the number you know the energy and that's the reason why we must get capital n that is the reason why we must try to calculate n and how do you calculate n very simple integrate the different quantum states given by ged in equation number 55 integrate them where from zero energy to ef energy the integration limits are zero to ef by ef because after ef the electrons will not exist and why this number is equal to the energy this number is equal to energy because only one electron in one quantum state. so integrated you can do this wonderful integration which is so difficult to perform square root over ed extremely difficult and complicated mathematics leads us to 16 root 2 pi v m to the power 3 by 2 3 h cube and you get the answer ef to the power of 3 by 2 let us let us vanish all in between and look at the look at n n is equal to ef to the power 3 by 2 multiplied by this constant so for any particular system that you consider any 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 solid or metal that you're considering you you specify v rest of the things are specified electrons mass is specified so the number of electron states in total is equal to ef to the power 3 by 2 now you can rotate the equation a bit you can rotate the equation a bit and you can define for me energy as ef is equal to h square by 2m 3n by 8 pi v to the power 2 by 3 again again what does the fermi energy depend upon forget h square by 2m 3 then 8 pi what does it depend upon it depends directly upon n by v to the power of 2 by 3 that's how you have to read equations in any field of physics so continue make everything else a constant and then remember that the fermi energy depends entirely upon n by v the density of free electrons i hope uh, this is a little bit clear to you right is it may i look at the chat box <sighs> So, so many chats now. Ah, okay, right. So, I can now, I think if the resonance between my understanding and your understanding has been struck a little, in next seven, eight minutes, we'll be through with this electron energy distribution. And hence, you are completely now armed with understanding statistical mechanics through the classical way, through the quantum way, but not using partition function. This sentence is extremely important. You have actually understood the entire basis of quantum and statistical mechanics, quantum and classical statistical mechanics, to the my three lectures delivered till now, whereby you understand what is statistical mechanics, what is probability, and how it is applied. Now, at the last section of this, before we jump with our partition function, is the electron energy distribution. And the obvious question that comes is why the electrons in a metal do not contribute to its specific heat except at very high and at very low temperatures why the electrons in a metal do not contribute to its specific heat except at very high and except at very low temperatures now let us look let us just think about what equations have we got whatever equations have we got if we want to write any d okay the distribution yeah we, we are actually always talking about distribution distribution so nede is equal to ge fed this is the first basic equation i talked about right from the beginning now we know ge and we know fe fe is the fermi dirac distribution function and ge is the density of states here the number of electrons and you substitute the two values you get nede so now what are we calculating we got the number of electrons happy we have got the fermi energy very happy and now the last we just want to know 
what is the distribution of energy amongst the electrons that are present in a particular metal okay so now let us substitute fermi energy value in equation number 57 and if we do that which we just calculated earlier if you do the substitution obviously you have to do it once by your own hands otherwise you'll never get the feel of it so electron energy distribution is now expressed in terms of fermi energy and the and in totality including the fermi dirac distribution function F, fe so ge and fe multiplied substitute ef and you get net right electron energy distribution is what we have got after all this discussion I will now also show the plot of this electron energy distribution. Let's see if it's in the next. Uh -huh. Okay, let, let, let's 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 go to the next slide again. It has got the same problem. Just a sec. So. Yeah. So electron energy, I was here and then now. This formula of NED, which I just talked about, I'll show you the diagram. The diagram is here. Let's have a glimpse of it. The distribution of energy amongst the various electrons in a particular solid with respect to E can be looked about like this. So as you see, at lower energies, it is near the distribution is near zero, keeps on increasing, and then at EF it falls sharply. At three different temperatures, our deviations shown to you: zero kelvins, three hundred kelvins, twelve hundred kelvins. And if you remember, in the comparison chart that I showed day before yesterday, I showed that at higher temperatures, how this particular graph. Is not uh, it starts behaving like an, like, a, like an exponential. It starts deviating, as you can see around EF. So now let's look at the let's look at the final argument that we need to understand all this. Now it is it is very interesting to determine the average ener electron energy at zero kelvins. How do you do average electron energy? It's very easy. We first find the total energy at zero kelvins. You do that. Multiply E, any d and zero to EF. And now, since at T is equal to zero kelvins, all the electron energies are either less than or they are equal to Fermi energy. As I've explained, we can equate this exponential factor to be equal to zero, e to the power e minus ef, and that will obviously come out to be infinity. So, e to the power minus, and hence we can have e zero is equal to this expression. You solve this integration, and you get the expression e zero is equal to three by five n ef. What is this E0? It is the total energy at zero kelvins. Total energy at zero kelvins. So the total energy at zero kelvins can be calculated as just a corollary of the distribution function, any DE, that we calculated in the last slide. So what was any? Any is equal to GEFE. What did we do G for GE? We considered standing waves. What did we do for FE? We use Fermi Dirac distribution. Therefore, the number of uh, the number of uh, the total energy that you are calculating now here has incorporated those concepts. And through these concepts, we come to the value that the total energy at zero kelvins is equal to three by five into n, the total number of electrons in a system, multiplied by the Fermi energy EF. Now, generally, for metals, the Fermi energies are usually several electron volts. You, you can consult some, some values available on the internet or in any book. So, the average electron energy in them at zero kelvins will be obviously also of this order, right? So, the temperature of an ideal gas whose molecules of, will have an average kinetic energy of one electron volt is known to be about, say, 10,000 above kelvins. So, if the free electrons behaved classically, a sample of copper would have to be at a temperature of 50,000 kelvins. Just imagine 50,000 kelvins for its electrons to have the same average energy they have actually at zero kelvins. The average electron energy at T is equal to zero comes out to be 3 by 5 EF. 
now this is not the this is not the end this is not the end one this is just the, what you say a kind of this kind of understanding of statistical mechanics is uh, this kind of understanding of statistical mechanics is nothing else but a kind of a quick trailer to grasp the complete subject it is a quick trailer although not really trailer in the uh, in the uh, literal sense but it gives you a very good idea of understanding statistical mechanics we understand what is probability we understand the occurrence of events we know probability distribution and then we apply it to radiation to black body and then we apply it to solids for specific heat use bose einstein concept and then we apply it to photons get planck's laws explanation and then we use fermi dirac distribution to understand behavior of electrons in a metal what did we do we have in fact we have in fact understood statistical mechanics its applications its scope arguments by which it developed so it's a beautiful way of understanding the whole uh, story of statistical mechanics and now we can arm ourselves with more and more mathematical expressions like partition function and so on to understand it in a different perspective right so now um, i will show you i will show you something one minute yeah so can you see this no once again there is a slight problem just just a sec somehow it gets hung yeah should be possible now yeah so it is going like this i don't know why yeah so i will now quickly quickly show you how what i said is also connected to the perspective of partition function using the ppt of uh, dr sanjay so you see i also spoke about microstates macrostates and phase space and he spoke in detail about probability fluctuations and equilibrium states let us quickly we will we don't have to go through all these lines we know that what are microstates and macrostates by now and how we deal with it and then in a statistical system we can use the concept of phase space the phase space of an n particle system is a 6n dimensional state please look at the last line of the slide that's exactly what we said and then comes the phase space trajectory of a system this phase space trajectory of a system requires the perspective of phase space which is a 6n dimensional space having the three dimensional momentum space and three dimensional position space and now if you have such a phase space of 6n dimensions and if you now plot a particular point in this phase space then that point represents the state of the system this is where i left day before yesterday while i had started speaking about hamilton's um, the canonical coordinates and momentum so now you see our way of dealing with statistical mechanics is just shifting to the other kind but it will lead to the same thing right so the phase space trajectory of a system simply means the trajectory the trajectory or the path followed by a system shown here by this you see this there is this black oval okay this is your system where is it plotted it is plotted in the phase space what is phase space phase space is a combination of momentum space and coordinate space and coordinate space the momentum space and the coordinate space can be best understood by using hamilton's equations of motion where these canonical uh, the coordinates momenta and uh, position are connected to each other through the equations of motions of hamilton which you know very well right 
So with this concept, if I now plot a system, then it will be just a point in a phase space. Okay. What does it describe? It describes the state of the system. What is the state of the system? The state of the system must signify what all things? All the thermodynamic eight quantities, pressure, volume, temperature, entropy, internal energy, Helmholtz free energy, Gibbs free energy, and all these eight quantities. That are defined. Additionally, its position is defined. Additionally, its momentum is defined. And position and momentum are defined in three different bodies. If you combine all this together, then you have your state of the system. Your state of the system. And that state of the system, this oval black point, signifies completely all these quantities that I'm talking about. You know its position, you know its momenta. If you know its momenta, you know its energy. Now, if the state of the system changes, now if the state of the system changes, it will fall, it will choose, it will land up at some other point. So if this black uh, black oval point will be somewhere here because the state has changed. It is not moving. It is not with respect to time. So the trajectory here is not with respect to time. Del rho del t we are not considering. We are considering that the density of the phase space, the density of the states is equal, the density of phase space is not to be studied with respect to time. So the trajectory in the phase space shows that the system system's state has changed. The state of the system has changed. And if the state of the system has changed, it leads to a new position in the phase space. So this black oval point, which is in the fourth quadrant, if its state changes, it can come to the first quadrant, just to make you understand. And then it can go to the second quadrant, yeah, the positive negative quadrant, which in coordinate axis we called as y and minus x. Or then it can go to the third quadrant. So if you now join the different states of the system, which are signified by points in this diagram of phase space, you will get a trajectory. And that is the phase space trajectory of a system. And here the concept of phase space, as well as Hamilton's equations of motion, which connect canonical coordinates Q and canonical momenta together are symbolized in this fashion. And obviously we have to remember that if you impose constraints on the system, then the degrees of freedom of the systems will reduce. As I said yesterday, if an ant is supposed to move on the surface of the ball, then its motion is constrained. It must move in such a manner that its distance to the center of that ball on which the ant is moving remains a constant because I impose that condition. So constraints on the system restrict the trajectory to regions and or hypersurfaces of the phase space. So it's not that the if you have plotted in a phase space some system, it can just go left, right, wherever it wants. No. It will be guided by the constraints imposed upon the system. What are constraints on the system? They can be anything. They can be anything. Keep the number of the particles constant. Keep the energy constant. Additionally, keep the energy constant, but must obey with this or must obey this particular condition. So whatever conditions that you impose on a system, they reduce the degree of freedom of the system. Right? So then... Then I, yes, day before yesterday, I spoke about ensemble and all this is directly consider, uh, connected together. Ensemble is collection of identical copies of the system. I'm using intentionally this very particular slide so that you're able to connect that every uh, talk is ultimately leading you to the same understanding level. It's not that you're running in different directions. What is a collection of identical copies of the system? You have a system. Now you can do one thing. You can observe it when the state changes plot it, then again the state changes, again you plot it, then you connected it by a line and you get a trajectory. This trajectory shows that the system's state has changed. State is defined by momentum, position and all those eight quantities of thermodynamics. Right? Or I can say, I'm not going to do like this. What I'm going to do, I'm going to imagine that I've copied this black oval dot, black oval dot, several times mentally. Yeah? Several times mentally, I've made identical copies of this black dot in my mind. And then I have an ensemble. So an ensemble is a, what you call a Xerox copy, a mental Xerox copy of the system that you are, a mental Xerox copy of the system that you are considering. And therefore, if you do that, then you don't have to wait. You can simply talk about the ensemble. It's a mental copy. Why it is a mental copy? Because it signifies different states. How is one copy different from another? You'll say this one is existing in this state and the other one is existing in this state. 
you can simultaneously talk about two things but actually they are copies of the same one what is the difference their states are changing and then you can simultaneously put everything into the phase space why because you have brought in the concept of ensemble the ensembles are of three types micro canonical canonical and grand canonical you know about it how do you can represent an ensemble in a phase space it can be represented by a swarm of points swarm like the swarm of bees so it's like you have got a collection it is random and it is representing the different states of the system i will not go through the all the details but i will show this portion of this lecture was covered from patria's first unit first chapter and if you look at huang or if you look at rife or um, yeah huang or rife any of these two books or mandel you will arrive at the same perspective that means understanding of statistical mechanics by talking about position and momenta canonical coordinates ensemble levallois theorem del rho del t is equal to 0 and the density of the phase space points so if in that diagram if in this diagram which i showed if in this diagram i have a swarm of points like you just do dot 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 okay so swarm of points then that is representing an ensemble a collection a collection of identical copies made where mentally why because you want to signify or denote the different states of the system if you do that then the density of the phase space points of an ensemble rho are dependent upon q the position p the momenta and time t and then you can say that rho represents the probability of any random element of the system okay and hence the connection between the density so uh, this is just to so show you how all these points are already connected but definitely this subject is quite confusing because the approach followed by most of the texts and the books available for any student of any level is highly confusing one way is to just take up either huang or rife and stick to it till you understand statistical mechanics completely or you take up a book like mandel or patria and you understand from that very book only then you can be consistently clear with your concepts but it entirely depends upon level of your understanding as well as grasping of concepts clarity and so on so you now then if you talk about ensembles ensembles are mental copies of the system and ensemble average of a quantity can be written as please look at you already uh, you already know this equation it is fqp rho qpt qn p are momentum uh, position and momentum respectively divided by Rho, P, Q, T, P, three n, Q, Y, three n, because they are three n number of coordinates, right? So D Q to the power three n, D P to the power three n, okay, and so on. So in his lecture, uh, Professor uh, Doctor Khanje had explained very nicely how through this particular approach, you also uh, come to the understanding of classical statistical mechanics. So postulate of equal a priori probability was used in the same way as I had explained. and then i will keep quickly then comes this very important distribution this very important distribution it is called canonical distribution of uh, it is called the canonical distribution so canonical distribution that means if you have any system having a temperature t which means that it is in contact with some heat reservoir then the probability that it is in a state any state having an energy er is given by this beautiful small nice equation what is the probability the probability has to be c exponential minus er by kt exponential probability so probability is exponential in nature where c is denoted by this particular function so this does it now if you want to understand the canonical distribution of probability for any event that's the reason why everywhere we are starting with exponential so this canonical distribution is well explained in the book of rife Uh, of berkeley series and also of micro hill publication the books are shared with you kindly revise these concepts or from patria and come to terms with understanding statistical mechanics through the concept of canonical distribution number 1 phase space trajectory ensembles partition function and only then you can in totality move towards repeating repeating you will repeat uh, fermi dirac distribution for a metal which i did today both signs and distribution for explanation of black body and the behavior of um, uh, and and the behavior of specific heat in the case of solids so 
so all, all those three cases which i did very simply today without using partition function has to be redone and understand and understood through partition function and then you know uh, both the perspectives so this is the connection uh, which was uh, uh, which was uh, there in his slides and also in mine and so i hope that now if you go back and listen to his lecture and listen to dr aditya's lecture in um, um, in 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 uh, your video uh, youtube channel of nasi delhi chapter you will be able to appreciate and infer in totality the details or the perspectives or understanding whatever you say of statistics so uh, with this uh, with this i think uh, we have had already quite a long session today because it is necessary to grasp what you hear rather than to keep on listening so uh, i think uh, i will just now share uh, a set of numericals with you which i will in detail uh, pass on in the whatsapp and it is expected of you to go through these numericals and i will be giving several more can you see can you see this can you see problems on classical statistics yes ma'am yeah so problems on classical statistics so here you see i will i will not go through step by step because then it will be too long it will require a lot of time i am posting it on whatsapp uh, common group kindly look at here if you just look at any beginning equation where is it coming to all kinds of distributions are using that exponential function and the moment we understand this look at how long are the solutions they are hardly two three steps and you get the answer two three steps and you get the answer the question appears to be intricate however the the concepts to be applied in the probability are extremely uh, extremely trivial if 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 they are clear to you if they are clear to you clear to you so here again the canonical distribution has been used the probability concept has been used and so on and so forth obviously it makes no sense to scroll through a document completely like this so i'm passing it on please look at it and if you have any questions you can post them on the whatsapp or through email as you like so uh, i will stop sharing this and uh, so with these words i think we stop today and uh, we meet again i've tried my best to explain those things which lead to a confusion in the minds of a student it might be that your level is higher than this in that case you find it as a revision it might be that your level is lower than this then you find it as an uh, real explanation for all the students who are participating in this webinar uh, a little bit of equalizing is required in order to get a broader perspective and hence it is automatically clear for any kind of uh, course whether uni of university type or of entrance type the moment your concepts are clear you will be able to recognize the numerical in less than 15 seconds and if you can do that only then you can say you have understood your physics well and the moment you understand your you can recognize the numerical you can re recognize whether to be using classical concept or uh, quantum concept to use a partition function or it can be done simply without any application of partition function what is it that i have to use in case your concepts are clear you will find that the statistical mechanics numericals are never lengthy in nature because they you hardly need few steps and simple mathematics and they are through so it is necessary to grasp the concept of a subject and not do thousand numericals without understanding physics that at least is my opinion and i'm sure many people will share my opinion in this so with uh, with these words i end up today i will now uh capital with some numericals tomorrow which will also be shared to view completely however so keep please do not keep asking they will be shared with you and tomorrow uh, i will be giving you more numericals in statistical mechanics and again a flavor of statistical mechanics through this partition function concept so that you are enabled to read any book suggested uh, by us to you or you know them already very nicely and attempt more and more numericals and at any time for any subject that is completed with you for example classical emt and uh, the third one that we did uh, classical emt and the statistical mechanics you are welcome to pose a question through email uh, preferably so that it can be forwarded to the concerned teacher and then they solve it if you have any problem you write clearly what is the problem and it will come back to you but it will take 
some time. It cannot be done instantly. So say two, three days when they have time, they'll do. So with these words, I think uh, I'll take leave today. So thank you very much. Enjoy physics and uh, keep in focus. Life is very short and very important. It is necessary to have uh, many aspects in life and knowledge is one great aspect. So with these words, thank you so much. Thanks to you no. too, ma'am. We are very highly grateful to you. It is really very difficult to manage both the roles at the same time, convener and the uh, speaker in the uh, same webinar. Thanks a lot, ma'am. So questions, questions which have not been answered, they will be answered by tomorrow or day after. I'm here with you always, so do not panic. And Veer Pandyan, yesterday one of your questions were not understandable. Please reframe your question and post it either on WhatsApp or through email. So, okay, uh, Dr. Parul, thank you so much for hosting and for your kind patience. I request you to kindly end the, uh, end the meeting for today. And as I said, we start uh, nuclear physics basics and then later in the, sub, later in the week, nuclear physics at uh, master's level also. And I think it would be a crime <laughs> if you miss all this beautiful knowledge coming our way. Okay, let's end the meeting right now. It's okay, quite ma'am, I'm going to end the meeting. Thank you. I request you all to fill the feedback form which I will post on the WhatsApp, please. Thank you. <laughs>